this this slide program is about the many different factors that cause the North American culture, society, the personality of the North Americans to be so different, to turn out so different, and eventually re rebel against the British Empire. First thing, if you look at this, you can see in a period of 70 years, the population explodes. Several reasons, mostly was a natural increase in population, but the other is more and more immigration as people in the old country, as they called it, in Europe and England and Scotland and Ireland in particular, begin to hear about all the wonderful things or at least relative or at least all the wonderful things that, the, that they can have land and, and they have freedom of religion and the government is least invasive in their lives. So by 1770, you've got this very diverse ethnic, racial, and religious colonies. That's very different than what you find in England. England is a very, uh, there are not immigrants into England or migrants into England. People are migrating out of the country because it's very crowded, the cities are overcrowded, the people uh, that have families, the, there's not enough land. A, a guy has a small farm of two hectares of land and then he ends up with two or three sons and there's not enough land to divide amongst them. So therefore, they got to go. The younger ones have to go. 10% from England, 80,000 immigrants. 10% from England, 36% Scotch-Irish from Northern Ireland, and 33% African slaves, 15% German principalities, because there was no, what we know today, uh, the German, Germany, because that didn't really happen until the 1880s when Otto von Bismarck put Germany together. 10% from Scotland, and if you look at this, England, Scots-Irish, Germans, and Scottish are all Protestants. That, that plays a big part in this, too. By the 1770, they were more distinctly American. Obviously, not the Loyalists, who would later support the, the, or be against the Revolution, but so the, there was something very different. I just saw, I think I went to SlideShare, and there was a slideshow about explaining how the American accent developed from the accents of all these different, if you've, if you've heard people from Scotland and Ireland and England, they have very strongly different accents, but no one in the United States, what became the United States, has that particular accent today, and certainly uh, over, well, it was a couple hundred years ago, it's gone away. The population usually stayed, only the great adventurers went more than 50, 100 miles from the coast, not even 100, more 50. A very low ratio of people to land. You could get land very cheap. There were land grants in each one of the states. Uh, you could expand your farm in a great demand for labor because they need, the more and more land you have, the more and more hands you need to, to work on the land. Uh, by 1770, the colonists were very, had a very high standard of living, and this is obviously in comparison to what you would find back in England and Scotland and Ireland and the rest of Europe, too. The population exploded 600% in the first half of the 1700s, and that kind of a thing causes all kinds of uh, changes, and change itself causes changes in attitude, changes in changes in latitude, changes in, in the way people think about what their current situation is and in what they're going to find in the future. This period was um, at the beginning of what's called the Great Divide. What was, the question is, what was it about uh, England in particular and the colonies in North America and what was it about the, these people that made their situation so very different that by the mid-1700s they felt uh, almost compelled to rebel against the control that, uh, of the parliament and the king of England? 
Puritans being those who settled in New England. New England is Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, at that time, it was Maine, and there was no Vermont. It was in New Hampshire and Connecticut. Those people, very large, they're farmers, so very large families. They need large families to take care of, of the farms. The women had a very, very difficult life. If when you read history, you realize that in almost all cultures, women have a very different life and very difficult life. Uh, limited land available to immigrants, that depends on where you were. Very powerful Indian tribes, the, the Iroquois and the Mohicans. My father, when he retired from the Army, we lived upstate New York, right at the bottom. If you look at a map of New York on the east side of where Vermont is, there's a big, long lake. And that big, long lake is called Lake Champlain. And that's, that's where I was raised. And that was Iroquois and Mohican country. If you want to see a really good movie about that kind of thing, um, The Last of the Mohicans. A wonderful, wonderful movie about the, the, the indigenous population and their relationship with the French and, and the British in the French and Indian War. Parsed out land, younger sons, I mentioned how they, they had to go find something. If, if you think about it, I'm thinking about an analogy. The conquistadors were typically the second, third, fourth sons of maybe minor nobles, middle class nobles or, or, or other nobles. And the reason they became conquistadors is because they didn't inherit the land and the estate and the title. So they either went into the clergy or they became soldiers, but they didn't inherit all the wealth. Consumerism, Th this, is a, this is a big issue. When you study about mercantilism, and if you go to SlideShare and type in mercantilism, you can learn all about it. It was the system of the, the British wanted to control of northern, northern colonies, the, the, the New England colonies, all the colonies, of their consumerist traits. What is it they wanted? Well, the British at that time were beginning to bring things back. They had English uh, textile, but they were bringing ceramics from China and metal goods they were making. This was before the Industrial Revolution. And the North Americans, colonists, they wanted to have more goods. This ev eventually evolves into the, I read a book recently, it's called The Mauling of America. Uh, the Americans have a consumerist society. Everybody's got to have buy, buy, buy. Uh, and I'm beginning to think that it, that sort of spreads all over. I mean, I came to Ecuador 25 years ago. There were like three malls, and now there's more like 40 malls in the city. They're everywhere, and everybody wants to buy. And the reason they want to buy, is I, I wrote it here, they needed to own things and display their lovely objects. And everybody can see that you're doing better, and they, they measure their success and their lives by physical material possessions rather than by education um, or other measurements of success. And it mentions in the book tea and ritual, the ritual of teas. You've got to have the proper teapot and the tea strainer. And if you'll notice, you'll know that uh, the British have four o'clock is tea time area, and it's a, it's a socializing. I don't know what they do anymore. I was just thinking about this. Now that everybody's got uh, iPhones, we don't need to get together to socialize anymore. So how do we drink our tea together? Consumption of British goods made them look and feel like British. And then the British were really smart, and they invented things like, now you've got to think about what happens when you, when you when you're building this the this, this shipping and the, the trade routes and everything from England to the northern colonies and from the northern colonies back to England and then to the Caribbean and so on, it becomes a very complex thing. The British invented credit, the invented, British invented um, insurance. You gotta, if you're going to have ships trading, you need an insurance company. It's called, the first one was Lloyd's of London. To, to ensure so you wouldn't have massive loss if the ship goes down, which they did frequently. And then the Americans, they became more and more independent as they developed their own industries. And they also had their own ideas about what was it to be a British, what they called a British subject. 
and eventually they became fe feeling less and less like subjects and more and more like Americans. I mentioned here the merchant economy. We're talking about New England. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts. That was the last place I lived for years before I came to Ecuador. And these are merchant cities. And what I put this in here because uh, people, farmers, especially big farmers, they have a rather derogatory opinion of merchants, people who buy things and then try to sell it for a little more. Uh, merchants are kind of low class in the minds of people. Even today, uh, Guayaquil is a merchant city. Uh, the people in Quito, uh, that's a, that is the capital of Ecuador, so therefore they feel more um, Castellano and they feel more, um, they look down on the merchants of Guayaquil. And the fishing areas, very beautiful if you ever decide to go to the universities. And a lot of my students go to the universities in Boston, around Boston. Massachusetts, probably it's my fault because I, I know the directors of admissions in a lot of schools. Uh, you can go down to Martha's Vineyard. If you look at a map of Massachusetts on the far east, there's a little hook that sticks out. That's called Cape Cod. I used to go there. That was our beach place. And then, of course, if you live in fishing cities, fishing towns, where ships go in and out, there's a lot of smuggling. So the merchants, the merchants are smugglers, and the merchants make business, and the merchants get rich, so the merchants become the elite, particularly in Boston. Here, if you look up there where it says Massachusetts, Massachusetts points to what today is Maine and Massachusetts, and then next to it, where it says New Hampshire, today that's New Hampshire and Vermont. Well, actually, the one to the, just a little bit where between the W on New York and what's New Hampshire, that's the state of Vermont. So there are 13 colonies, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, <coughs> excuse me, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Florida belongs to the Spanish. Today it belongs to the Cubans, Spanish. Oh, and Venezuelans, too. The middle colonies, they develop a little bit differently. The, I put in here German, Swiss, and Austria as either Northern European uh, Protestants. They, you'll have to someday maybe read about the, what's called the Protestant work ethic. What made these people develop? One of the questions in, in history is uh, what made these people develop so differently from the Spanish colonies, and a lot of it was about the religion. There's a famous book by Max Weber, The Protestant Work Ethic. Uh, they just had a whole different attitude. These were, these were not conquistadores looking to conquer and looking to have, make other people do the work, and, and the indigenous people of South America and Central America and the slaves of Brazil and the Caribbean. These were people who were individualists, they were hard workers. They believed that work was a, a thing of God. God did not, did not like people who take things from other people. God wanted everybody to be industrious. That's a good word. They left Europe because of landlords and government abuse and exploitation, and they look, looking for religious freedom. And you'll see this coming up, uh, Lutherans, German Protestants, Reform Lutherans, Mennonites, Quakers, Amish. You may have seen pictures of Amish people in western Pennsylvania, Moravians, Dunkers. Those are all of the northern European and also people like from the area what's called Denmark and eventually you end up with Swedes and Norwegians, but not, right, not so much right away. The middle colonies are also, and this is still a very dominant th factor, Scotch-Irish. Scotch-Irish means Northern Ireland. Today it's Northern Ireland, part of the British Commonwealth. And then there's Southern Ireland, which is uh, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. And from Scotland and Northern England, all Protestants. My family name, my last name is Whitman. It's a Scots-English name. My grandmother's name was Schwinier, which is French-Canadian, because my father is from was from up on the Canadian border about 50 miles south of Montreal. My mother, on the other hand, her people, the Mead and the Adamses, not the Adams family, 
they went over the Appalachian Mountains back in the 1760s, 1730s. One of my cousins traced them all back and had <laughs> such a hobby. He went to visit the graveyards of people that were buried in the 1700s. Uh, those are Scotch-Irish. And those people who moved up into the mountains of western North, North Carolina, uh, is a, what's today is eastern Tennessee, the, in the high mountains of the Appalachians, all devout Protestants. That eventually, we'll get into that later, it comes, breaks down into Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and all kinds of different uh, sects of, of, the, of the Protestant religions. Very clannish people. Pennsylvania is different. Pennsylvania becomes more settled by Roman Catholics. And Pennsylvania is, is the, the, the comment there, the best poor man's country is because um, farmland, wonderful farmland. Philadelphia is the second largest city or third, no second. Unlimited opportunities for free men and also it becomes the passageway of going in the Shenandoah Valley, which is right south of Pennsylvania, west of what today is Washington, D.C., uh, Virginia, the Carolinas, and also it was the, the passage for going west. Protestants were prosperous people. The culture of consumerism, which I mentioned, Quakers were very industrious, very thrifty. What happens when a culture is very thrifty? Honest, and these are some of the sayings, what you call in Spanish, dichos of the Quakers. Uh, God helps those who help themselves. In other words, don't be begging. A penny saved is a penny earned. In other words, be thrifty. God gives all things to industry. Be industrious. Be work, hardworking, honest, hardworking people. And nothing but money is sweeter than honey. I don't know where that came from. The southern colonies, it becomes very different. And, and this is where you should start beginning to appreciate the difference between the merchant, mercantile, commercial culture of New England in particular and the upper middle states with the south. Those people in the south do not become merchants and they are not industrious. They want other people to do the work for them. They exploit the importation of slaves. We're going to show you later that uh, wasn't uh, most slaves, most blacks during this period went from Africa to Brazil and Africa to the West Indies. Uh, Barbados, Jamaica, uh, what were the other islands? I forgot. Haiti, obviously, later. But a, a smaller percentage, a much smaller percentage, were taken to North America and almost all of those being Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. 95% of them arrive in the Lower South and they stay in the Lower South. Then there's something we call the unifying experiences, the roots in agriculture in the South. The South is uh, almost all agriculture. You don't find, we're, we're working our way up to the Civil War and when we get to the 1850s, one thing you need to look at is the advantages and disadvantages that the South or excuse me, the North had over the South. And one of them was the North was industrialized and the South never really did industrialize. They had great warriors, soldiers, but they were not industrialized. And if you're gonna have a war, you better have factories that can make the guns and the boots and the, and the clothing and the, everything that you need for an army. Because if you don't, you're not gonna win, which we will find out. The Southerners, I wrote in here, turned off by the ex excessive piety of the North America, or the, the Northerners, and thought they, they were the ones who were looking down at the Northerners as being just m merchants. Um, and the whites became aware uh, uh, that they were very different than the British. In the 18, or excuse me, the 1730s, you have something that happens that happens I wouldn't say frequently, but regularly throughout American history since 17, 1700s. And it's called a, a great awakening or a, a religious revival where society becomes more cynical and they go away, further away with each new generation, uh, are less religious, uh, 
less ethical, less moral, and then things get turned around, and mostly Protestant groups were, di oh, I mentioned that the, the United States has historically been very, very suspicious of and dislike Roman Catholicism and the Vatican, even when you get up to the 19, 1959 election of John F. Kennedy, the 1960 election of John F. Kennedy, uh, they didn't want, people were saying that, no, we can't have a Catholic president because he'll take orders from the Vatican, which was a bunch of baloney, but that's what people said. So the Protestants disagreed greatly on their theological, they, they read the Bible and disagreed on many different things of the Bible. And they broke up into these different groups, become deists. A deist is the person who's looking uh, for God's plan. The answer is not in the Bible, it's not from the priests, it's from science and it's from reason. Of course all this comes from the Enlightenment and they all read, people who were literate read about the Rousseau and John Locke and Voltaire, my, one of my favorites of the period, and the idea is that uh, all men have rights. Government doesn't have the right to abuse them, uh, which eventually Jefferson and all the people who invent the, actually invented the government of the United States, they're very well aware of these kind of things. I mentioned that must clear away obstacles. You can study the world around you and think for yourself. Use your reason. Don't believe things just because someone tells you, some one in authority, some priest, some teacher, uh, government. Think for yourself what's best for yourself. We just finished a two-hour uh, philosophy class this morning specifically about that. And finally, no, almost finally, the Great Awakening by the mid-1730s uh, emphasized Jonathan Edwards' We must go back to God. We must, we must be careful of what we do in life. We must be more ethical, more moral, because God is vengeful. And you know that we're born into original sin and that the Savior died to free us from our sins, but we've got to go back and concentrate on these things. And you, you get these stories about great revival meetings. And, the, and by 18, 1830s and 40s, they had the second great awakening. And then finally, the bonds of empire. These people began in the 1730s and 40s, by the 1750s and 60s for sure, the great resentment of the British. The British were um, overbearing. They, they, they wanted to put more restrictions on colonists and you'll find this in your textbook, more restrictions. They needed money from the colonists to support the British Army that they had in North, North uh, America that they left there after the 18, 1760s and the French and Indian War. And the North American colonists deeply resented being taxed without being allowed to have representatives in the parliament. And this leads to revolution. Thank you very much.